began by wanting to initiate a dialogue between military and labor history uh, to do for labor history or to do for military history really what has been done so creatively by those working on the history of labor uh, indian labor uh, in the british empire uh, to show how much empire depended not only on the laborers who went to sugar plantations overseas or worked tea plantations within india but also that infrastructure of labor which created um, contunments um, military bridges roads and railways along the line of india front in of indian frontiers so in a sense i was trying to investigate those bland categories military logistics and supply and transport and to try and see the kind of human labor not only of men but also of women and children which went into that infrastructure and how it was repurposed for global war in 1914 but apart from recovering that story of a hitherto neglected component of the indian army i also wanted to uh, re uh, find a way to locate india more integrally in world war 1 instead of seeing it as an external event to which she contributed i wanted to take a look at the geopolitics of empire as they worked out from what has been called the sub imperial hub of india and in a sense it is uh, these uh, sub imperial drives across india's land and sea frontiers which fed into world war 1 escalated the conflict and by the end of war was bringing that conflict right back to india's borders in the form of the third afghan war and the kukichin uprising at the other end of india so these were my aims in the book and i was fortunate uh, to be a, uh, you know to to participate regularly in a body called the association of indian labor historians which was very open to different kinds uh, of labor history and so that gave me uh, the kind of framework i needed to write a more transnational history of world war 1 and one which tried to put together military history which often operates in a kind of silo and interestingly it operates sometimes even at a remove from something which you would think would be very integral to it like international relations and i tried to place military history in relation to other kinds of histories the history of labor of law uh, of migration because the british empire benefited a lot from the circulation of indian populations across the land and sea frontiers of india i think the pandemic the war world war 1 was like the pandemic in the sense that it suddenly made visible that labor those labor resources which empire relied upon both for its commercial viable uh, prosperity as well as for its military might it made visible that labor suddenly and uh, in the same way in a sense that the pandemic and the flight of labor from our city suddenly made visible the extent to which the complexity of urban life all the amenities which we depend upon uh, rest so much on this hidden uh, labor army which suddenly became visible literally walking all the way home so that was one kind of take away from the story the second theme which i realized was uh, makes one think about the contemporary context is that in world war 1 two things came together one was that the army expanded massively the manpower hunger of the war was such that they had to tap new communities including those from very marginal and stigmatized sections of society and so the nature of the army changed Uh, this destabilized hierarchies 
uh, hierarchies were, re were reintegrated, uh, re you know, made stable again when the war was over, but not to the same extent. But two things came together. And we can see this development in the key year 1917, which is on the one hand, the army expanded to take in a whole host of new communities. And this then changes our perception of a very Punjab centric view of the impact of World War I. Now, secondly, because of the intensification of war demands upon India, demands for human resources, demands for money, demands for material resources, uh, the colonial regime had to offer to open a dialogue on the paths towards self-government. Now, this had an electrifying effect on, on political life. That is, communities who did not have a voice in the political sphere began to put together associations on platforms to make demands for representation and for officials help for officially supported schemes of uplift in terms of educational assistance, assistance to get employment, which would enable them to participate in that expanded field of representation. So what you had was the assertiveness of communities, you heard their voices, and the Indian elites, while demanding democratization on the one hand, were also getting very apprehensive about what the consequences of this democratization of political life were going to be. So I think sometimes people have focused, historians have focused a lot on the limitations of the constitutional reforms, which were given in 1919. But if you look at the kind of petitions which the Secretary of State was getting, from Dalits, from tribal communities, from various bodies as he sort of moved across India negotiating the terms of the new political arrangements, we really get a sense of political life opening out. And if there is one essay which gives us a sense of this moment, it is an essay by Ambedkar called A Strange Event, where he points out that in the 1890s, the Congress had said that social questions were to be kept apart from political questions. Suddenly, they were willing to accept that social reconstruction had to be a part of political reconstruction. So in a sense, you have in 1917, and this process continues through the Rowlett agitation and the non-cooperation movement by which the issue of social advancement of marginalized communities is put on the agenda as part of the path towards uh, self-government. And this includes also labor. That is, labor now emerges as a political constituency. I was surprised by the positive response to my book. And I think part of that is that we are at another moment where there's a, there are, you know, there's a, there's a kind of real upheaval going on in political and public life. And all kinds of new constituencies are emerging and making their demands, uh, both for social reconstruction and for more political space. So it was a kind of, um, I, I mean, I, I can see similarities between that moment and this. Now, thirdly, and this is the takeaway, which is also important, that uh, we have, uh, this is the last chapter of my book, which is about demobilization and the long extension of the war, so far as India was concerned. That is, the timelines of the war were different for India. For India, the war didn't stop in 1918. India was expected to carry on providing those boots on the ground which would help Britain to maintain the new territories which had acquired, it had acquired, particularly in the Middle East. Now, the process of moving from war into peace, therefore, was a very slow one for India, and it was one which required a variety of different kinds of interventions. Now, one of those interventions really was the movement against the Rowlatt Act, because the Rowlatt Act, in effect, tried to continue emergency 
executive-dominated regimes of preventive detention into peacetime, saying that though the war was over, the threat of what they called revolutionary and anarchical crime was not over. So what you had was an effort to perpetuate the kind of executive high-handedness, the readiness to do away with due process, to deny people the right to legal representation and to appeal and to continue it into peacetime. So in a sense, what I think has not been taken account of is that there was a very, uh, as a component of the Rowlett Act, you also had, uh, you had various, what were called anti-peace celebrations. That is, it sounds odd to say anti-peace celebrations because what these were, were an effort to actually move from a state of war to a state of peace. The argument was that unless Indians had a say in the way that the Indian army was going to be used, unless Indians were liberated from the kind of wartime emergency legislation which had marked the war years, there was no situation of real peace and therefore peace celebrations were a farce. So it is that particular story which we need to remember now. It is one of the most significant worldwide, uh, significant stories of a struggle for civil liberty, a struggle for liberty, civil liberties, which involved not just leaders like Gandhi or the Ali brothers, but also involved the urban masses who in a sense came out onto the streets for the first time. And we seem to be forgetting that legacy, that particular massive struggle for civil, civil liberties, which took place around the Rowlett Act in 1990. The book is a product, of course, of, my, uh, my, of what I learned from those new developments in history writing. So that was the most enjoyable part of the experience. So, the f so let me say one of those uh, experiences was uh, my interaction with students and colleagues from Northeast India, which made me aware of the kind of work they were doing to ensure that their histories did not remain peripheral to the history of modern India. And that drew my attention to the border and the role of the border in understanding uh, Indian history. Um, I think one of the nicest, one of the invitations that I was most honored by was an invitation from a Northeastern Students Collective at the Tata Institute of Social Studies. It's called Mosaic. They asked me to give a talk. And considering that my own work can never plumb the plumb the history of this region because I don't have the cultural capital or the language resources to do more than scratch the surface. I deeply appreciated that, uh, that invitation. Uh, the second moment which I was able to take advantage of was the quest towards writing a history which is focuses on a transnational and comparative history. That is, we have to always look at different spatial frames when we are writing history. And each spatial frame makes its own demands. And we may choose to work within one spatial frame, which can be micro history, it can be regional or interregional or international history, but we always have to be aware of its connection with histories taking place in different spatial frames because the experience of India in the war was a lumpy one. Some regions and some communities experienced it more. Others experienced it more indirectly. For example, through cruelly inflationary prices. So you have uh, Amitabh Bachchan's father, the famous poet, who talked about how his mother complained about the clay with which he used to smooth out her kitchen floors, why had the price of clay gone up behind, behind, uh, due to the war? So her husband then explained that, you know, uh, the, the man who takes his donkey to the river to dig out the clay 
the fuel, the fodder for his donkey costs more, his food costs more, so he's going to sell you the clay at a higher price. So that's why the clay which is coming to your kitchen, the price of the clay has gone up during the war. So this is just to talk about the kind of very indirect ways in which um, the experience of the war came home to women. And what we must also remember is that because of the uneven impact of the war, we can't just talk about the contribution of women to the war, though that contribution was very real. That is, you could not have taken away, for example, so many men from Haryana or from Punjab, unless you had a female and child workforce which stepped in to fill in the gap, right? And it was the women on tea plantations in Ceylon. It was women tapping rubber trees in South India. It was women in jute factories and cotton factories who were turning out the material, which was moving across in ships, ships which were loaded by women bearing coal on their heads. And these ships took this material across both to, you know, to Britain or to America, where trade surpluses helped to balance Britain's trade deficits. So, if we go into the material resources that India provided, we could probably write a very rich history of the way in which female and child labor contributed to the war.